Manny Ellis was 33, trying to find some rhythm in his troubled life. Just arrest him! Then on March 3rd last year, he was caught on video struggling with Tacoma police and died in their custody. I want to see black people be safe. So do state lawmakers, sponsoring more than a dozen bills this session to make police more accountable. The biggest thing is what is the, the safest and most efficient tactics that we can be using. The fight for racial justice is now a fight in Olympia over major changes to law enforcement. I think there is an urgency that I've never seen before. This bill does not appear to consider officer safety. Our panel weighs in on policing the police. Next on City Inside Out. Welcome to this edition of City Inside Out. I'm your host, Brian Callanan. The death of George Floyd last year at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer led to calls for police reform across our nation. Here in Washington, state lawmakers are taking up that challenge with several bills that could impact everything from officer tactics to disciplining bad cops and even police union contract negotiations. The question now, can the momentum of last year's protests somehow unlock a decades-long stalemate over how to significantly change the police accountability system. Officers, lawmakers, and advocates are all weighing in on the best way to police the police. A warning, some of the video you're about to see is graphic. This small memorial on Ainsworth Avenue South in Tacoma marks where Manuel Ellis's life ended. The 33-year-old man died while in police custody last March. But for some, this spot also marks a beginning in the fight for increased police accountability. To me, Manny was walking while black. Kimberly Mays was Ellis's landlord and went to church with him where he played the drums. Mays, also a social services worker, says Ellis was turning his life around. He was in a drug treatment program and had plans to work in landscaping. Police stopped Ellis on a late night walk home from a 7-Eleven. Then handcuffed him and put him in a chokehold, which led to his death at this scene. With eyewitness reports disputing officers' accounts of what happened, and with a botched initial investigation by Pierce County, the case is now in the hands of the Washington State Patrol and State Attorney General. And Kimberly Mays is frustrated and frightened. After Manny got killed just going to the store, my own children are very afraid of the police. We should not be afraid of the police. We should be able to trust the police to protect us not to harm us. All chokeholds and neck restraints are considered use of deadly force and should not be used at all. State Representative Jesse Johnson of the 30th Legislative District in Federal Way is sponsoring House Bill 1054, which would set new requirements for police tactics and equipment and ban chokeholds, tear gas, and grenade launchers or other military gear. But changing tactics is just one part of a spectrum of police accountability bills in Olympia this session. Lawmakers also want to change how officers are certified, trained, and decertified, how cops are investigated and prosecuted for wrongdoing, and how police unions are allowed to arbitrate on officer training and discipline. After worldwide protests in 2020 following the deaths of George Floyd, Manuel Ellis, Breonna Taylor, and others. Johnson says the police reform movement has momentum. And we know as a legislature, we have to do something. We cannot let this legislative session pass without passing a police accountability, robust police accountability bills. But with the desire for robust action comes robust debate. Please give further consideration before taking away tools that give police officers time and distance to safely resolve dangerous situations. Law enforcement officers in unions across the state are speaking in opposition to the legislature's police accountability plans. No justice, no peace. With regard to tactics, some worry that outright bans on some crowd control weapons could push officers into using more violent techniques and do more harm than good. It is the legislature's responsibility to ensure that well-intentioned language does not endanger the public 
or the public servants. This is not uh, regulation or change for the sake of regulation and change. It's because there has been a pattern of problems. Senator Manka Dingra of the 45th Legislative District in Redmond says our state's police accountability system is simply not working. A Seattle Times report shows our state decertifies only about 13 officers per year out of the 11,000 officers statewide. Dingra is co-sponsoring Senate Bill 5051, which would add civilians to the state's Criminal Justice Training Commission and give the commission more leeway to certify and decertify officers. In serious misconduct cases, the commission could prevent officers from ever getting another police job. Senate Bill 5051 does not propose to make reasonable changes that we can support at this time. Unions are again pushing back, but may not be as unified in their opposition. After the expulsion of the 1,300-member Seattle Police Officers Guild from the King County Labor Council last year. Dingra says after years of work on police reform, she's hopeful new grassroots support for increased accountability will lead to action in this year's session urgency is there because once we have all seen something, we cannot unsee it. And so we have to move forward to address these these issues that have really plagued our society for many decades. This bill does not appear to consider officer safety. It's a battle this spring in Olympia as our state wrestles with police reform issues that are truly a matter of life and death. I'd like to see the laws change to hold police accountable for real. And joining us to discuss these issues, we have with us Ann Levinson. She is a retired judge and was appointed two terms to provide independent oversight for the Seattle Police Department. Also with us is Sonia Joseph with the Washington Coalition for Police Accountability. And finally, James Shrimpshire. He is with the Washington Fraternal Order of Police, representing 3,000 officers, tribal officers, troopers statewide. He's also the police chief of Algona. And let me start with you here. You actually helped in the drafting of Senate Bill 5051 the expansive certification and decertification measure from Senator Jamie Peterson. It's House Bill 1082 on the House side. Uh, we explain in our setup piece how very few officers are actually decertified in our state every year. And if they do lose their job for misconduct, they often move to just another department. If 5051 passes, we would have more civilians, fewer law enforcement officers involved in these decertification hearings that are held by the Criminal Justice Training Commission, the CJTC. I know that some police unions are pushing back on this, saying this could hurt an officer's right to due process. So I'd like your stance on this, on this legislation. How could this impact police accountability? I would say that with regard to decertification, we have one of the weakest laws in the country. So officers can engage in significant misconduct and not lose their license. So what we're trying to do is align what the public values and expectations are for how officers do their job with the way the licensing rules work. So, for example, if you engage in excessive force, certain types, if you engage in abuse of your position as a police officer, if there are other things, you should not have to be convicted of a felony to lose your license, just as with other professions. You want to make sure that those who are doing the job well have their due process rights. Those who are, uh, run, are committing misconduct also have due process rights, but the public also needs a strong voice in then what happens, how they're held accountability, how they're held accountable, mm -hmm. moving the process through in a way that better comports, better aligns with our expectations about robust accountability, as well as fairness and due process. So this bill would overhaul our state uh, in a way that provides, particularly for communities where they may be working with departments that are not holding officers accountable, We've not really had a robust state interaction. There hasn't been state oversight before. So this should make a pretty big difference, particularly for the kinds of families that we've seen who are suffering the harm of having right. to do, deal with these cases. Right. Thank you for summarizing that. And Sonia, this is really where you come in here. I, I know you have a personal connection to these issues here. I want you to briefly talk about your experience, if you could share that with us, and why you were involved with police reform in the state legislative session this session. Mm -hmm. I wanted to change policies that would help frame the future of policing in Washington state. My son, Giovanni Joseph McDade, was killed in a traffic stop. Um, he complied to a traffic stop and later fled the scene in his Honda. Mm -hmm. Officer Rush chased the vehicle and escalated the situation by using deadly force several times. 
Mm -hmm. In just under two minutes into the pursuit, Giovanni was trapped in a cul-de-sac and both officers trapped him in the cul-de-sac and Officer Davis parked his vehicle and walked around his vehicle mm -hmm. towards the side of Giovanni's car and shot two rounds. Wow. I, I know this is a difficult story to break down, but I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about your experience with it. So thank sure. you for, for sharing that with us here. Uh, I, I wondered if I could move to you next here, James, and talk about this because I know police unions stopped a similar certification measure at the state level back in 2014. I'm wondering if that changes this year. I wanna know if you and other police unions support this idea of giving civilians more power when it comes to decertification and also expanding the reasons for decertification to include, to include some of these crimes committed by off-duty officers too. In reference to this particular bill, there are things that the Fraternal Order of Police really enjoy or really like about the bill. And one of those is the remake up of the Criminal Justice Training Commission. Mm -hmm. we, we are in full support of having that more community led. Mm -hmm. um, we understand that we are public servants and that we should reflect the values of the communities that we serve. Mm -hmm. That being said, there are things in this bill um, that concern us when it comes to due process mm -hmm. that we would like, and as I testified to an opportunity to work with all stakeholders to kind of come up with a better solution that's uh, good for everyone. If I could, James, I'm going to stay with you and talk about how officers are investigated and prosecuted for wrongdoing. The state's looking into this, too. We saw it in the death of Manny Ellis that when one agency, Pierce County, investigates another agency, Tacoma Police, that can lead to some problems and damage community trust in the process here. So we're talking about House Bill 1267. It would set up this Office of Independent Investigation at the state level to oversee excessive force cases. I know you served on the governor's task force that helped shape this legislation, which is being debated and revised as we speak here. Do you support the goal of this bill, though, to have these independent police investigations, to have that separate unit there? And what would it take to create a system like this, do you think? So um, I do support independent investigations and the organization that I represent also supports independent investigations. This is one of the reasons we got engaged several years ago uh, around coming together on uh, I-940 and House Bill 1064 because we truly wanted an independent look. Um, what's in front of the legislature now that concerns us is that even in the task force, one of the main aspects uh, that everybody wanted to address was also the in, the independent prosecution or a independent prosecutor to review those cases. So our main opposition to currently what is in in front of the legislature that was introduced is the fact that it does not uh, contain independent prosecution. We also are concerned about the scope of, of the current bill. Um, you know, we're afraid that it, it's too vast and the amount of resources it would take to stand up this agency might be uh, too daunting. Mm. But ultimately, we, we are in support of independent investigations. Okay, thanks for putting a fine point on it. And Anne, maybe I can go to you next and talk about this here and maybe you can respond to some of the things James is talking about here and also just try to wrestle with this for us if you could. How big of a lift would it be to establish this new Office of Independent Investigations? Would it be part of the Attorney General's office or how would this work? Well, the current proposal is it would be part of the governor's office. But I think when you ask about how big a lift it might be, we should look at that against what it is we're trying to achieve. So if, if you look at what's happened in our state, more than 250 people have been killed by law enforcement um, in our state since 2013. That means that's about 32 uh, every year, community members, family members who are lost to uh, this kind of violence. And disproportionately, that impacts people of color and, and people who are suffering from a mental health crisis. Mm -hmm. So when we ask, is it too big a lift? I just think we have to, um, frame it with that in mind. What we're trying to do is to ensure that there is strong accountability uh, when this happens. And the more independence we can have in that process, uh, the better it'll be for community trust and confidence, and the better it'll be for all of these families who right now do not get the kind of follow through and 
uh, commitment to the integrity of these investigations that they so need. Yeah. Is it going to be a challenge when it comes to officers due process, though? Can you speak to that point that, that James brought up earlier? Yeah, I don't, I don't think having independent investigations in any way is detrimental to due process. Uh, what it provides is arm's length review, as similar to when you think about oversight and other aspects of policing. That's why we have civilian oversight. That's why we have folks such as the role I used to play that your arm's length, your objective, you're looking at it without the rela inherent relationships. Mm -hmm. It's not a blaming any individual who's involved in the process. It's mm -hmm. ensuring that there are safeguards in place to protect that independence on, on investigations that are so fundamentally important to community trust. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, Sonia, I wanna go to you next here and talk about this. I know you still have a lawsuit pending in federal district court against the Kent Police Department over your son's death there. Do you think an office of independent, uh, independent investigations would have made a difference in your son's case? What do you think? I do believe so. Um, because of the credibility and transparency that um, an independent investigation brings, um, as of right now, my attorneys seek independent investigation, outsourcing it to a specialist. And <clears throat> That investigation is completely different than what the Kent um, independent team final um, investigation results. I see, oh, I see. Yes. Yeah, and, and maybe I can stick with you, Sonia, for one more point here. There's another bill out there, Senate Bill 5066, that talks about officers needing to intervene when they see wrongdoing. Do you have yeah. any thoughts about that? Because uh, it was multiple officers that responded in your son's case there when he passed. And I, I just wonder your thoughts on that. Um, you know, when there's misconduct, it, it is a duty of an officer to intervene and call it out and report it. Um, <clears throat> because that's being transparent with the public that is um, holding your duty to the highest standards. Got it. Thanks very much for that. Sonia, I'm gonna ask you one more question here. I wanna talk about police tactics, if I could. You testified on House Bill 1054 recently. This covers everything from chokeholds to tear gas, banning those things, also changing when officers could start a car chase, which was involved in your son's case, for sure. Uh, some officers would say they need to rely on their judgment to start car chases or when they use force. They would say that limiting that could have a negative impact on the safety of the public and officers too. Your thoughts on that. What is your stance on this House Bill 1054 when it comes to police tactics? Um, so 1054 <clears throat> mainly reduces discriminatory policing. Um, as we know that the majority of um, these ta violent tactics are used on people of color. Mm. And <clears throat> there are other means for um, arresting someone and de-escalating and not using violent tactics. Got it. We're going to see what comes out of that one for sure. Uh, James, maybe I can go to you next year. I have heard some officers say that chokeholds are sometimes necessary. Cops can be trained to use these techniques in a safe way. But then again, you've got 17 police departments statewide that have outlawed this practice. So chokeholds first. Do officers need them? And I'd like to bring up tear gas, too, if I could. If the U.S. military has been banned from using it, why let police have it? I'll tackle the uh chokeholds or the uh, vascular neck restraints, yeah. as, as some of my uh, colleagues like to call them. What I will tell you is we're in favor of moving them to the level of deadly force. So that means it's a last resort. Um, that comes from the Fraternal Order of Police was one of the 12 um, national agencies that signed on to a federal consensus policy back in 2017 dealing around use of force. And um, we stand by our statement, which puts those two those two types of techniques at the level of deadly force and should be used at a last resort. And when it comes to uh, tear gas, um, the point is well taken that the military no longer uses tear gas. One of the situations that led to this being placed in the tactics bill um, is the fact that it's used in a riot situation or a protest situation. We are not in favor of using um, any type of irritant in a protest situation like CS gas or tear gas. 
what we do want to leave the option open for and for consideration only because it's a less lethal option and, and, and is when you have a barricaded subject in a house, a normal uh, protocol is to utilize CS gas or tear gas to try to get compliance, get them to come on. So the other options in that case, you know, is to send officers in and force a deadly force encounter. You know, and so we want to avoid that. And so this is one of the tools that we use, um, you know, when we're dealing with barricaded subjects, and we would like that option. Okay. Uh, and let me go to you uh, next here, because I'm just trying to figure out if you see any bright lines here when it comes to the use of force. You heard that idea about using tear gas on barricaded suspects, for example. In mm -hmm. certain life and death situations, uh, some officers would say chokeholds are necessary here. What's going to get negotiated here with poli police tactics, do you think, at the state level? I think the bill is very close. The points that law enforcement have raised deserve consideration, but what happens is when you have those allowances, if there's not sufficient training or sufficient oversight or accountability, there can be misuse of those. And that's the community's concern. Mm -hmm. So what the negotiation is about is can you narrowly draw exceptions so that when there are instances where these tactics should be allowed, you don't have to worry about having opened a door to misuse of those tactics. Got it. I do think, Brian, it's important to note that overall, what the legislature is doing this year is setting best practices statewide. Yeah. So it's how officers should do the work. You know, at the local level, we're looking at what officers should do, what law enforcement should do, right, in their role as sworn enforcement mm -hmm. individuals. But at the state level, they're looking at the how. So what should the best practices be? And then what should be prohibited? And then the third bucket is, if they don't comply with those best practices or those prohibitions, what kind of accountability should there be? Right. If you don't do that at the statewide level, you're leaving it to community and family members to have to address these issues yep. community by community, and that's just an unfair burden to put on them. Thank you very much for that. And I want to stick with you and we'll talk about the, the uh, issue of arbitration, if we could, how police yeah. unions can negotiate on behalf of officers. There's a range of options before the legislature. Senate Bill 5134 would say police accountability and discipline should not be negotiated. Then you got Senate Bill 5055, doesn't go as far. It would change the arbitration process, create this state pool of arbiters to deal with these officer discipline cases. I, I, I wanna talk about this because officer discipline studies show is reduced or overturned more than half the time in arbitration. So you tweak the process, completely try to overhaul it. What do you think is possible this session? That's a great question. I uh, testified on this, uh, I, excuse me, an expert declaration on this in the consent decree process, looking nationally at police disciplinary appeals. Private arbitration has so many downsides in the context of police discipline. So the important thing is to take a step back and say, how do you set up a disciplinary appeals process that works for law enforcement situations? whether it's uh, each jurisdiction, if they have different type of appeals, there have to be best practices. The hearings have to be open. There have to be particular standards arbitrators use or other decision makers use. They shouldn't be allowed to substitute their judgment for that of the chief and a number of other things. In order to have accountability, you have to be able to have discipline upheld. So if you have a chief or a sheriff who's doing the right thing, mm -hmm. you've got to have a disciplinary appeals process that provides for due process, but also that the community can rely on. And right mm -hmm. now the process is fraught with so many obstacles and impediments. Yeah. It, it's not a fair and it's not effective. And we need disciplinary appeals to be focused in a way that really aligns with accountability. And that is missing. Thank you very much for that. James, I'll head to you next. Uh, just in talking with legislators about this, they're just saying there's such an urgency to respond to all the Black Lives Matter protests we've seen over the past year here and not negotiate this moment away with a union contract. So are police willing to give up some power when it comes to union arbitration or what sort of significant change do you see that's possible on that front coming out of this session? So thank you. So what I would say is both bills that you talked about, one, if you notice, it had overwhelming police support, and that would be to um, tweak the arbitration process, mm -hmm. take it all at the state level, make it transparent, have a pool of, of arbitrators, and, and allow that consistency statewide, like uh, the judge talked about earlier. And we are in favor of that. Uh, you know, quite frankly, a majority of police uh, bargaining units 
have different ways of handling the arbitrator. Some use private arbitrators, some use state arbitrators. Mm -hmm. We would like um, um, them all to be uh, state arbitrators and to have those decisions published at the state level for transparency sake. I think that's a fair playing ground that we can get behind. And we have, we've, we've come out strong in support of that. Um, that being said, you know, circumventing what can and can't be negotiated as far as working conditions, I would merely point to, you know, uh, there's a situation going on in Benton County where the sheriff was way overstepping and had they not had collective bargaining and the ability to go to, you know, their union representation, those employees would still be in a situation where a, a terrible work environment. And so that's just an example, you know, and again, we, I want to be very clear. We believe that bad eggs should be held accountable and we believe that due process should be the same for a police officer or any person on the street. Got it. Thanks very much for that. Uh, we're a little short on time, so we need to start wrapping up here. Sonia, let me start wrapping up with you. We've seen so much momentum over the past year following the death of George Floyd and others at the hands of police. But history really shows that change comes slowly when it, we're talking about state legislature here. Are you optimistic we are going to see some lasting reform come out of Olympia this session? Um, I do believe so. <clears throat> These bills work together and it, they're strong. Um, you know, it, it'll, it's to improve the relationships with community and law enforcement and mm -hmm. to have accountability for the profession. Um, <clears throat> and all of these priorities um, are set with great expectations mm -hmm. and rules which the community expect law enforcement to operate under. And I do believe that um, having all of these five priorities pass um, this session um, with great hopes that they will. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thanks very much for that. James, 30-second version, if you can. Is this the year our state's going to pass some meaningful police reform legislation and make it stick? What do you think? So uh, our hope is that whatever comes out of this legislative session, we're working on this problem together, working for us with a solution together. And, you know, that we shape law enforcement in this state uh, to represent the values of the community we serve. Okay. I, and you've worked on these issues for decades now here. What do you see coming out of this session and any final words for lawmakers considering these bills too? Yeah, I think this session holds more hope than any I've seen in terms of these, these law enforcement reforms. And I think it's largely due to Sonia and other families. This is a voice that's been missing in the legislative arena uh, for a long time. So mm -hmm. it, it needs not be uh, folks like me or others who have, have worked in these systems. It sh really should be the voice of the families and impacted communities. And we're seeing that in a really terrific way this session. So I'm, I'm very hopeful that major reform will come out of this year's session. All right, well, thank you very much. And we will be right back. What are people on social media saying about these issues? One person writes, we need real police accountability. Let's have criminal justice reform that keeps all people safe, but not senselessly imprisoned or afraid. Another person writes, you want less policing? Be prepared to handle these public disorder offenses yourselves. We'd like to know what you think. Send us an email at contact at seattlechannel.org or find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Coming up next week, helping with homelessness. As the pandemic enters its second year, city and county leaders are scrambling to house our growing homeless population in hotel rooms, vacant buildings, and tiny house villages. There's also a new sales tax for affordable housing. What's the long-term plan to tackle our regional homelessness crisis? We bring you an update next time on City Inside Out. I hope you join us.